Good job, Brother Larry. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11 this morning. It's out of my sermon, A Joyful Life. A Joyful Life. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. I want to ask you this morning, how is your life? Is your life a life that is joyful? Now, I didn't ask you if you were happy. I asked you if you were joyful because there is a difference. You know, there's circumstances coming in our lives, and you may be in one today that well, it's not too, not too pleasant if it's not making you happy, but you can still have joy. You can still have joy in your life. I run across this. This is from Max Licato. He writes about a certain king. He says this. No man had no more reason to be miserable than this one yet one man. But yet he was more than joyful. His first home was a palace. Servants were at his fingertips. The snap of his finger changed the course of history. His name was known and loved. He had everything. Well, power respect. And then he had nothing. Students of the event still ponder it. Historians stumble as they attempt to explain it. How could a king lose everything in one instant? One moment he was royalty. The next he was in poverty. His bed became at best a borrowed pallet and usually the hard earth. He never owned even the most basic mode of transportation. It was dependent upon handouts for his income. He was sometimes so hungry he would eat raw grain or pick fruit off a tree. He knew what it was like to be rained on, to be cold. He knew what it meant to have no home. His palace grounds had been spotless. Now he was exposed to filth. He had never known disease but was now surrounded by illness. In his kingdom he had been re revered. Now he was ridiculed. His neighbors tried to lynch him. Some called him a lunatic. His family even tried to confine him to their homes. Those who didn't ridicule him tried to use him. They wanted favors. They wanted tricks. He was a novelty to them. They wanted to be seen with him, that is, until being with him was out of fashion. Then they wanted to kill him. He was accused of a crime he never committed. Witnesses were hired to lie. The jury was rigged. No lawyer was assigned to his defense. A judge, swayed by pol uh, pol politics, handed down the death penalty. They killed him. He left as he came penniless. He was buried in a barred grave, his funeral financed by compassionate friends. Though he once had everything, he died with only a crown of thorns. He should have been miserable. He should have been uh, bitter. He had every right to be a pot of bullying anger, but he wasn't. He was joyful. Sour tales don't attract a following. People followed him wherever he went. Children avoid sore heads. Children scampered after this man. Crowds didn't gather to listen to the woeful. Crowds clamored to hear him. Why? He was joyful. He was joyful when he was poor. He was joyful when he was abandoned. He was joyful when he was betrayed. He was even joyful as he hung on the tool of torture. His hands pierced with six-inch Roman spikes. Jesus embodied a stubborn joy, a joy that refused to bend in the wind of hard times, a joy that held its ground against pain, a joy whose roots extended deep into the bedrock of eternity. Friend, are you anything like him? Are you a joyful person? Now, I didn't ask you again if you were happy. There's a difference. Most of us instinctively recognize that there is a difference between joy and happiness. Yet it is challenged to put an exact definition upon it. Webster says it like this, joy, the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospects of possessing what one desires. I believe joy is much more than an emotion. That comes when everything is going well, when we are rich and successful and have all the stuff we desire. You see, I believe joy is much more than that. I believe joy is something that we find and can have and contain all the time, as long as we have Jesus. 
Let's read the scriptures. Verses 9 through 11 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy, my joy, Christ's joy is what it's talking about, might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the love and the grace of God. Father, we don't deserve this joy, but because of your grace, it is available to each and every one. Father, I'm thankful, Lord, to be joyful today. Lord, I know circumstances in my life are up and down all the time. And Lord, I know that sometimes I'm sad and, and, and maybe even be grumpy, but God, I still have the joy of Jesus in my heart. Father, all I got to do is remember the cross. Look at the cross. And think about what you've done for me, Father. And realize what awaits me when I leave this old world. And Father, I know that, uh, that it won't be long. Father, I know that door will open one day. And Father, in your presence will be the eternal joy forever and ever. In Jesus now, we love you and we thank you. Amen and amen. A joyful life. A joyful life is continuing in the love of Christ. Now, yes, you have to start in Christ first. You have to give your heart and your life to Jesus in order to even begin to understand what joy is all about. And again, we can look at life, we can look at situations, we can look at people, they're running everywhere, they're doing everything to find that joy, that satisfaction of their soul. That's what everybody desires. That's what you want. You might not understand it all, and sometimes I don't, but... But the truth is, your soul, your, your soul, your desire is to be joyful and to be joyful all the time. Well, it, it's coming to Christ. Because when we come to Christ, we find a perfect love. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved. You are unconditionally loved in Christ. There cannot be a more delightful thought to be filled, though, uh, 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 to be filled the soul of a man than to know that the Son of God loves you. Jesus loves you, my friend. Amen. He loves you. Jesus said that the measure you use to measure how much the Father loves Him is the same measure that measures how much He loves you. Again, look at that verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? That however much God the Father loves God the Son, Jesus, that's how much Jesus loves you, child of God. But you've got to start in that love. You've got to give your heart and your life to Jesus. You've got to accept Him as your Savior. You've got to confess your sins. And you begin to enjoy this love of Christ in your heart and in your life that, that your soul needs. Do you have the joy of Jesus this morning? He loves you just as much as God the Father loves him. And isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? That ought to make you sing every day amazing grace. Hey? Amen? Amen? Because that's what it is. Think for a moment about the love of the Father for his son. Child of God, Jesus loves you as much as that. And that's a deep love. That's a love that we really don't even understand. God loves his son. It's so deep. It's really bottomless. And Jesus says, I love you that much too. I love you, child of God, that much. Jesus says here that just as the Father loved him, so he loves us, that is, without end. So let us just for a moment soak in the truth of, of that precious promise, that precious love of Jesus. If you know there are a million reasons... You know, there's a million reasons why, why Christ should hate me. And you're, there's not one reason that he should love me, but yet he does. I have failed him so many times, and so have you. Amen? I have failed him so many times, but and yet it, it, it just, it's mind-boggling to think that he still loves me. He knows what I've done. He knows me better than I know myself. He's mindful of every sin I've ever committed, all my infirmities, all my weakness. He knows all about these things, and yet he still looks at me and says, I love you as much as my father loves me. Amen. That's amazing, Grace, right there. That's right. 
That's wonderful. That's precious. He loves those who are in him. Again, look at that verse. If my father loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye, in, continue ye in my love. Just as surely as the father will always continue to love Jesus, so will Jesus always continue to love the redeemed. Yes, even when we fail, he still loves us. God the Father loves Jesus uh, always without any change. The Father loved the Son for the, from, from the same at, at all times, forever and ever. And when Christ said as he hung on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want you to know that God the Father turned his face from his Son, but he never turned his heart from his Son. Right. Amen? Amen. Yeah. He turned his face, but he never turned his heart. And sometimes we fail the Lord, but I want you to know sometimes we, we slip up and we do even as Christians. Uh, and, but yet he still loves us and his heart never turns away from us. Mm. There have been times in my life that I failed God, but God's love has never failed me. Can you say amen right there? Amen. You fail God, but God's love never fails you. It's there for you. So note the father's perfect love uh, for the son did not also spare him from trials. Are you in the middle of a trial now? No, he came to do the father's will, namely the cross. So does the Lord's perfect love for you mean that, that he will spare you from the trials? No, no, because it's usually through such trials that we come to know him more deeply. It's through those trials that many times we, we understand his compassion and his love and his tenderness and his care for our lives in those trials. And yes, you're going to have trials. Now, just being a Christian does not eliminate you from trials. You're going to have them. They are going to come. You're going to have heartaches. You're going to have pains. You're going to have sickness. You're going to have death in your life. But yet the love and the comfort of God is still there that will enable you to constantly be joyful. Joyful. So as someone has said, never interpret God's love by your circumstances. Rather, interpret your circumstance by God's love. As you do, you will, you will know joy. Joy that is not about feelings or circumstances or economy, uh, economics, but rather joy that is about being a part of something incredible, the kingdom of God. About being a part of something eternal, the kingdom of God. About being a part of a, a people who, who meet here week after week together to worship and to seek God. You know, I love that old song. I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God. Are you? That will bring joy to your heart. To realize that you are part of the family of God. Are you today? Are you in Jesus? Have you surrendered your heart and life to him? Are you a part of the family of God? Are you enjoying the joy that comes in Christ Jesus today? I love being a part of the family of God. I love being a part of a mission to share the incredible good news of salvation with the world on, this high, on the highway to hell. There's plenty of people today. The doors are open to share the gospel. You don't have to go far. You don't have to go many places. You don't have to stay there very long to run into somebody that's lost. Amen. <laughs> Preacher, I'm scared to witness. Just tell them how God's been good to you. Just tell them how much joy you have in Jesus. That's all you got to do. Joy is about knowing that we are loved by God. We are saved by God. And then knowing that nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. When you're born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, nothing else really matters. You're on your way to heaven, child. Friend, the measure of Christ's love for you was told on the cross of Calvary. How much did Jesus love me, preacher? Just take a look at the cross. That's how much. Yes. But I want you to understand this as we look at verse 9 again. He says, I continue you in my love. The Lord desires, Jesus desires for us to remain in his love. Our, our enjoyment of, of his love depends upon our continuing in it. 
to never get sidetracked, to never get persuaded otherwise, to never lose sight of the eternal truth of Christmas, which is Emmanuel, God with us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is welcoming us to remain under his wings, to remain wrapped up in his arms, to remain always in the midst of the fact that we are loved perfectly, unconditionally, truly by the grace of God. Mm. Remain in my love. But let's face it. Even as Christians, sometimes in our lives we slip up. Sometimes we don't do the normal, and that is to abide in Him. Sometimes we, we do turn aside. Why is that, preacher? Because we live in this flesh. You've heard me say this from the pulpit. We're in a constant battle between the spirit and the flesh, the spiritual world and the physical world. We're a constant. I, the, biggest, the biggest thing that gives me problem is my flesh. Now you can make out like the devil gives you your biggest enemy. But I want to tell you something. Your flesh is right there with it. Your flesh is right there desiring, wanting, amen. Amen. Say the truth. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Always doing battle against the flesh. Be some simple things too, you know. I got blood sugar, but you set up a big old, you set up a big old thing of ice cream. I'm telling you, put some peanut butter in there with it. Mmm. I'm wanting it. Amen. But we're always wanting it, aren't we? Yeah. And I've said that there sometimes when I get to go fishing and I little old uh, 15 foot aluminum flat bottom boat and there's that big nice boat rides by. I'm like, boy, I'd like to have one of those. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We do. Our, our, sometimes we let our flesh get in the way. Sometimes we're not abiding where we should be. Christ always loves his love, is always there. His love never turns aside, even though at times we turn aside. That's right. Aren't you glad that God's not like you and I? Huh? We get mad at each other, don't we? That's right. Some of my husbands and wives, sometimes we get mad at each other. We got to a little bit. And then one of them want to come back and you know, and want to make amends, you know. Come back and make amends. And sometimes we'll just give them the cold shoulder for a while like I ain't ready to do that. I want to stay mad a little bit. Aren't you glad God's not that way? When you turn your side from God and, and, and God's love's still there and he's waiting with open arms, he says, just turn around. I'm right here. My arms are open. Aren't you glad when you turn it back to God, when you come to your senses, He's there with His arms open and not His back to you? That's right. Amen? That's the kind of love I'm talking about. So Jesus said, if you'll remain in me, you'll, you'll remain in joy. But I will tell you something. You get out of God's will. You start walking on your own. You start doing your own thing. And life begins to become miserable. Miserable. I have so many people that in my ministry have told me, come up and say, Preacher, I want to get back to where I was. You know, I want to get back. But what's the problem? Face up to the problem. The problem is the Lord's there. He wants you to reign in His love. It's you that has turned and steered away. You can get right back to where you was and grow even more and squeeze the Lord even tighter. All you got to do is turn back to Him. Amen? Don't just quit talking about it. Just turn around and do it. Get back in his arms. Get back in his love. Get active with the Lord. Because I want to tell you something. If you're not doing what you used to do, and maybe, uh, and, uh, and I know I understand that sometimes physically we can't, our body, but that don't mean spiritually we can't. We can always be there spiritually, amen? In prayer, worship, and praise, and singing in our hearts. But if you physically can get away from God too, and spiritually, and you're not doing what you used to do, then you're not, in, you're not enjoying your life in Christ. You're not. You can... You can try to hide it. You can try to run from it all you want. But you're miserable. Just submit to it. You're miserable. Why? Because you're not abiding in there where you should be in Christ. Colossians 2.6 says, As you therefore receive Jesus Christ as the Lord, so walk ye in him. He says in 1 John 2.6, 
He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Christian, take for this for your own comfort, that there is neither any change in Jesus' love to those who rest in him. So joy has nothing to do with externals. It has nothing to do with your clothes or your looks or your size or your wallet. It has nothing to do uh, with your health or your career or your position in life. You might be suffering. You might uh, have everything you ever wanted or you might be without anything. But I want you to know joy is about something different. The joy that I'm talking about, the peace in your heart, the soothness of your soul, it has all to do with your heart, having a heart fixed upon his wondrous love, upon Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, upon him that died on that cross of Calvary. And it's a joy that passeth all knowledge and all understanding. It will fill your heart. It will cause you to praise him. It will cause you to give thanks always to the Lord. Amen. 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 Mm. My second main point, a joyful life is keeping his commandments. Obedience results in joy. What word pops in your mind when I say obedience? What would you, what would you say? Duty? Drudgery? Rules? Regulations? No fun? No fun. No fun at all. What if I said joy? What about joy? What about joy, the fullness of joy? Jesus associates obedience with our experiencing full joy in him. Jesus said again, look what it says in the scriptures here. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Folks, there's no better place to be than in the love of Jesus. Are you understanding that? There's, there's no better life. There's no better satisfaction. That you could go through life no matter the circumstances of your life. You could go through life with joy on your heart. If you just remain obedient to God. Serving the Lord. So Jesus doesn't let us think that abiding in his love is, is just a warm fuzzy feeling either. He plainly states that to abide in his love you must keep his commandments. We stay in his love through obeying the Lord. What does that mean? I mean, staying in his words. We know what his word tells us. How to live, what to do and what not to do. How to serve and how not to serve. But anyway, a believer can break fellowship with Christ. We, we, we all can do it. Cease to keep our, our thoughts on Christ. Walk away from Christ. Uh, but I want you to know something. Why would you want to walk away from the love of Jesus? Why would you want to look again at verse 9? If you keep my commandments, you shall be... Uh, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments, I abide in his love. How is it you give somebody to love you? How is it that you get somebody to love you? It is by doing what makes them happy. It is doing for them. It is thinking of them. And so when we are when just, just talking about obedience, it's just about putting Jesus first in our lives. And you say, you know what? If you really want to be loved, then you let Jesus uh, run your life, uh, run your life, show you the way to go, help you through life. In other words, be obedient to his word and you will remain in love. Hmm. So how, how, what does it mean? It simply means this. Do those things that make the Lord happy. Do you do the things that make your spouse happy to have a good life? Well, if your life's pretty turned upside down with your marriage, you might want to think on this. Do what makes your spouse happy. Put them first. And you remain in the love of Jesus. Jesus says if you'll just be obedient as I was obedient. He was obedient to the cross of Calvary. He gave his life to be obedient and he remained in the Father's love. Mm. Yes, there's times when we are not in that love. There's times when we tinker in the world. We flirt with the things of the world. There are times when we don't obey. We get disobedient and self-absorbed and we don't, we don't think about what he wants. Our mind is about on what we want. So yes, there are times when a Christian does not abide in the full sense of the love of Jesus because of their own doing. 
Jesus said that it is up to the believer to continue in his love. How? By doing what any person would do or want any other person would want them to do. And that is to, is to love them. The person draws near to the person he loves. He does good and tries to please that person. Amen. Now, now listen, we ought to be about every day pleasing the Lord. Every day of our life should be about pleasing the Lord. Now listen to me. If you want God's love to wrap his arms around you and bless you throughout the day, be with you all the time, show you the attention you desire, and everybody likes attention. Everybody likes attention, don't you? Say amen right there. Yeah, you like attention. You want God's attention? Well, God wants to love all over you, but you know what? You got to let it. You got to let him. You got to stay close to him. You got to serve him. You got to do his commandments as he requires in his word. When we keep his commandments, we are not just hearers of his word, but we are doers. And when we keep his commandments, we are not conformed to the world, but we are being transformed from the world. And yes, obedience results in joy. We sometimes believe that the opposite, that God has given us a list of, of things not to do. To limit our freedom, to make our lives miserable, but the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Obedience to God is a path to joy, not only because obeying the things we are not supposed to do saves us from pain and heartache many times, but also because in doing all the things that we're supposed to do, it brings significance to our life. It brings purpose to our life. But not only that, it brings life to us, true life and joy and happiness. Folks, there's no better life than serving the Lord. Amen. There's no better life than spending your time and your life doing for Jesus, for the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen? You, you cannot give him, I promise you that. He'll give you back more than you ever give him. But I'll tell you this too, he'll give you more love than you ever give him. You give him your attention, he's going to give you his attention. Let me ask you, how's your joy this morning? I didn't ask you if you was happy about being sick. I didn't ask you if you was happy about the circumstances in your life. But I want to know about your joy. And your joy in, through your life does not come through your spouse. The joy in your life does not come through your children. The joy in your life does not come through your grandchildren. They make you happy. You know, it's like that movie that I always refer to a lot. When that lady walks out and told the devil that he wasn't going to steal her joy. And told her husband he wasn't the one that gives her, her her joy. But it comes from the Lord. The joy of the Lord. There's nothing better than the joy of the Lord. He's the one that won't let you down, amen? It's also relatively easy to obey the Lord when things are going well. But again, but the test of obedience is when he takes you through difficult trials. At such time, you may not understand what these trials are happening, but be like Abraham walking up that Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. Remember that? Remember when the Lord said, said, I want you to take your son and I, I want you, Abraham, to walk up this mountain. I want you to take him up there and I want you to give him to me. I want you to take his life. I want you to sacrifice him for me. I can't begin to understand all the emotions of Abraham going up that hill with a knife by his side, taking his son, say, let's go up here, son. But what I do know about Abraham is he trusted God. Amen. And you see, joy is about trusting the Lord, no matter the circumstances that you're going through. You can have joy in the midst of whatever's happening in your life. That's God's word. That's God's promise. The, only, the world can only offer you joy, temporary joy, when things are going well. And it's relatively easy to be full of joy when you're happy, when you're married, your children are beautiful, you have a, you're satisfied with your paycheck, and your health is good. But I want to tell you something. That's all temporary. 
And if you take a quick look around this room, you'll see a lot of people that's going through situations in their life. There's people in here with all kinds of problems this morning. Aren't they? There's sickness on every pew this morning, just about it, of some sort. But that doesn't mean you don't have to have joy, that you can't have joy. Because God gave his life for you. God gave his, his uh, uh, life for you on the cross of Calvary to give you eternal joy. To give you something more than what this world can give you. You need that joy that, that is talked about here in the Bible. In Romans 5 and 3, he said, we exalt in our tribulations. James 1, 3, consider it all joy, my brother, when you can encounter various trials. 1 Peter 4, 13, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Listen to that. To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. Yes. Folks, we're just passing through here. It's getting better. Amen? We're just passing through this world and life's getting better. You say, preacher, you don't know my situation. Oh, I do if you're a child of God. Every second it ticks off every day that passes by, you're getting closer to that eternal joy that nothing or nobody can take away from you. And it's in Jesus Christ. We, we got a home waiting above. That ought to get you excited. Amen? Amen? To know that you've got that joy waiting on you. These old bodies are wearing out. This old house we're going to lay it down one day. But praise God, we're going to a place. Uh, I want you to know where there's no more sickness, no more death, no more heartache, no more pains. I'm telling you, it's going to be a time of rejoicing for eternity. Amen. 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 But you can have that joy here and now, that assurance of our Lord. I don't preach. I don't understand. Well, we got an example here. Jesus. Look what he says again in verse 10 and 11. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So we have an example here. Uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is our example. Abiding in the love of Christ as a standard, a supreme example, it is Jesus Christ himself. His joy and glory were doing the, was doing the will of God and looking ahead to the joy and the glory of eternal life with his father and with his followers. He was perfectly obedient to God and therefore he continued in the father's love. If you want to continue in the love of Christ and you want to know the love of Christ, first get into it. Give your heart to him. Give your life to him. And then every day of your life when you get up, uh, uh, you, look at, you look to God uh, first thing in the morning. And when you lay your head down at night, you still look to God all through the day. You follow God's commandments. You be obedient to the Lord. And you let God love you up. And there you'll find joy. Living for Jesus will bring you joy. Living for yourself will bring you heartache and pain. I promise you. We are to look at his obedience for our prime example. Christ paid the supreme price of obedience. He died and sacrificed himself uh, on the cross of Calvary. And therefore God's love for his son is very, very special. And that it is a super love, a supreme love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, he says. God's way is simple. Keep his commandments, and it is then that you will are abiding in Christ's love, which is essential if you, are, uh, if you want a genuine, fresh, and, and fruitful Christian life. But the way you keep your love for Christ fresh is to remember his great love for you. Never get over the wonder of the eternal Son of God's love for you and, and gave himself on the cross. Christ has one great purpose for believers, the completion of your joy. Look what he says again in the last part of verse 11, that your joy might, what? Be full. You see, I want you to know that God wants you to be joyful today. I want you to know the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ wants your joy to be full today. He doesn't want you to be living in misery. 
He doesn't want you to feel down and out. He wants you to feel that your life is significant. And I'm telling you from my own experience, you're never happy, you're never full until you are walking in obedience to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giving your life for Him. Then you'll find out what satisfaction is. Then you'll understand what life's all about here. Then you'll know what joy is. Folks, I'm telling you something. Joy is not, joy is not by having a big home. Joy is a, 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 let me put it as a big house. There's a difference between a house and a home, amen? I hope you have a home. And when you got a home, that's when Jesus is the head. When you got a home, that's when Jesus is put first. It's more than a big car. It's more than a big bank account. It's, it's more than, 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 than great experiences to travel in the world. It's that peace and that contentment inside. Remember this, that the Father loves him, so he loves those who are redeemed by his blood. And he wants you, if you're here today, born again, washed in his blood, he wants you to be full of joy. How do I stay full of joy? It's simply by abiding in Jesus Christ. Abide in me. In my love, he says. There you'll find that joy. Folks, there's no conceivable limit to the love of God to us in Jesus Christ. If you need proof of it, again, look to the cross and you'll see there he gave himself for us. He stripped himself naked to his shame that he might clothe us. He spared neither hand nor feet nor head nor back. Nay, how he spared not even his own heart, but poured out from it blood and water. The windows through which you can look into the heart or God's heart is the cross of Calvary. If you want to read the love of God, go and look through the wounds of the Savior. And as you stand looking through those wounds, you'll hear, and you'll hear that voice that says, come, welcome, come, I love you. So I want to ask you this morning, is your life full of joy? Do you want it to be full of joy? Do you desire it to be full of joy? Would you say here today, preacher, I'm a Christian, I've been saved, but i got to be honest to you, right now I feel empty. Why? Jesus said, abide in me and my love, and I will what? I will abide in you. Jesus said, be obedient to my commandments, and I will fill you with joy. So if, if, if you're here today and you say, Preacher, my life's just not what it ought to be, then I'm going to tell you something. Don't look to life for your joy. Look to Jesus. Don't look to your spouse for joy. Don't look to your children for joy. Don't look for your grandchildren to bring you joy. Some of these old ones, I tell you right now, grandchildren are wonderful, they're special, they're precious. But I'm going to tell you something. When they hit those teenage years, they don't know you no more. <laughs> they, go, they go their own way. I did it to my grandparents. And so now I try to eat up my little ones now just as much as I can because I know one day they'll be gone. You know that? I like taking my grandkids to the beach because you know what? Or to take vacation with me because when they get teenage years, they ain't going to want to go with me. I'm an old man. They want to go with their teenage friends. So I better take them now and enjoy it as much as I can. Amen? But I want to tell you something. No matter where you're young or old, Jesus will never abandon you. He never will. And he comes to you this morning and says, I want to fill you with joy. Joy that you can't get from anything, from any circumstance, from anybody else but Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning, you can say, preacher, I'm full of joy even though I'm sick. If you say, if you say here to the preacher, I'm full of joy today, even though I've got problems in my family, then you're one of those that's in Christ. Then you where you ought to be, abiding in Jesus. Because it's only in him that you're going to get what you need. And still be full of joy every day, no matter what's happening. As the pianist comes, I ask you to stand as we sing this morning. What are we singing? 638. Page 638. As you stand this morning. You say here, preacher, this morning, preacher, I don't know Jesus. Let me tell you something. He wants to fill you with joy.
He wants you to buy into his love because he wants to give you more, just as much love to you as God the Father has given him. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. But I believe it. Why would he save an old wretch like me? As we sing, when you come, whatever you need, this altar is open. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. Maybe you need to pray for somebody.